Well, will you take your copy of the scripture and turn with me to the book of Galatians? We will be in chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 this morning as we continue our study of the greatest Christmas gifts that have been given to us by God himself. Last week, we saw the gift of redemption, how Christ came to redeem us and, and pay our debt to release us from the slavery of sin and death. And this week, as we continue to move through this passage of Galatians, we'll see the second gift that Paul highlights, which is our adoption into the family of God. So this morning, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? The Apostle Paul, writing to the churches of Galatia, says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent his spirit, the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Heavenly Father, your word is truth. What we read here about the work that Christ has done for us in totality is truth. As we move through each aspect of this, whether it's our redemption, whether it is our adoption, whether it's the gift of the Spirit or our inheritance or, or fully our salvation, Father, I pray that as we study each one of these, our hearts are, are overcome in gratitude and, and humbleness before you for what you have done for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, when we hear the term adoption today, we think of it in modern terms. We might think of a young child who, through no fault of his or her own, finds themselves without a family. Maybe it's because they're mother or father passed away. Maybe it is because they have been in a situation that is terrible and they had to become a ward of the state. But what happens is when we think of adoption today, we think of these kinds of children who have come out of their homes and are being adopted into new families. They're in need of that new family, a loving family. And the families that typically adopt these children are doing so in order to show that child love. They're looking to bring in a child into their family to love and cherish and to, to adore that, that little one in, in the context of their family. And there's lots of reasons why they may be doing that. They may feel a gospel call to do it. They may be facing infertility. And as a result, this is the way that they can have a family. So when we read about adoption in the New Testament, and adoption is a prevalent theme, we sometimes project our modern understanding of what adoption is backwards onto the Roman culture in which Paul is writing. And when we do that, we make a mistake. And, and in fact, we, we are missing the richness and the depth of what this term means in Scripture. You see, if our modern understanding of adoption was all that there was regarding our adoption into the family of God, that would be amazing. Amen? It would be. It would be incredible. But let me tell you something. It is so much more. It is something even greater than that. And so to understand that term, we must first understand the relationships within the Roman family at the time that Paul is writing. And to do that, we have to understand who the different individuals are. At the head of each family was somebody called the paterfamilias. And that means the father of the family, the, the paterfamilias. Now, the, the person who was that position was the oldest male in the extended family. They had all the power and authority within that family. In fact, it's called the Patria Potestis. And that's what, uh, what we have here. 
this, this is a um, uh, position that meant that they had authority over everything that had to do with the family, the patria potestas. And, and that meant that they could sell land. Nobody else in the family could. They had authority over the children of the family, especially the sons. And guess what? That, that, that authority over the sons didn't end when the son came of age and got married and moved out and had their own family. The paterfamilias continued to have this autocratic authority over them at that point. The only person that they lost any control over were their daughters when they married and came under the authority of their husbands. So the, the paterfamilias had this, this incredible power. In fact, it was so great that in the early days of the Roman Empire and the Roman Republic, the paterfamilias could even exercise capital punishment over members of his family for whatever reason he deemed fit. If you upset the paterfamilias, you could lose your life. Now, later in the empire, that power was restricted somewhat but the ancient principle held sway for a long time. Now, if Romans did not adopt poor children or orphans in order to bring them into a loving, caring, and nurturing family, why did they adopt children? What was the reason for Roman adoption? Well, in some cases, that reason is the same as what it, was to, or what it is today. Some families just weren't able to have children naturally. And so in order to pass on the family legacy, the family name, the family lands and wealth, adoption was the only option available to them. And so they would look for children that they could have to uh, produce an heir to all of those things. Now, they did not go out looking for a child just so that they could hear giggles and coos and the pitter-patter of little feet around the villa. That wasn't exactly why the Romans were doing this. I'm sure that they enjoyed their children. I'm sure they loved their children. But that wasn't the primary purpose of children. The primary purpose of children was to pass on the legacy of the family and to produce an heir. But in many cases, adoption occurred even when there were natural-born children in the family, including sons. Now, sometimes what would happen is the father, the paterfamilias, would look at his sons and say, I wish that one was a little smarter. Or, boy, I wish that one had more patience and a better temperament. Or, I wish that one was more gifted in business so he could take over my business. You know, sometimes we think that today, don't we? We look at our own children and think those things like, oh boy. But, we stop and say, but I'm thankful for what God has blessed me with. I'm thankful for these children that God has entrusted to our stewardship for this time. That wasn't necessarily the case for Roman families. And so what would happen is if a Roman father looked at his children, his sons, and he thought these things, then he would go out looking for a better son. He would go out looking for someone who had those noble qualities that he could have be the heir to his name. And, and so they would look around and see who was there. You adopted that son because you found somebody who exceeded in capability the sons you already had. And so this adopted son was not a second class member of the family. They were the first class. They actually superseded the other natural born sons in order. They were the chosen children. And so they became the heirs of the family name and fortune. They weren't children that were just out on the streets in need of a loving home. They were chosen by the father because the father had a purpose for them. And so the Roman adoption process was actually a very formal event. And it was very difficult. Remember that patria potestas, the, the father's absolute authority over his son? Well, in order for an adoption to take place, that had to be severed in the other family. The father of that son had to sever his authority over the son in order to transfer it to the new father. And look, 
If this kid is so noble, don't you think the biological dad wants to keep him in the family anyway? So this is what's going on. And, and so there were negotiations. Prices had to be paid. And the, the formal process took place in kind of two steps. There were two trials, if you will. One was symbolic. And it took place in public. There would be a set of scales. And the, the son that the father wanted to adopt would be placed on the scales. And then he would come with his money and put it on the scales. And the son's real father would say, no, 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 and take him off the scales. This would happen three times in order to symbolize just how important this was. At the third time, the father would accept the, the amount that was put on the scales. And at that point, the son would become the son of the new family. And that Patria Potestas was severed over him. He no longer had that kind of authority over the, uh, over the child. Now, in the Roman adoption process, there were four very important aspects to, to it. First of all, the adopted son lost all of his rights and privileges in his birth family. When he became the member of the new family, he was no longer had any connection whatsoever, legally, morally, or, or in any other sense, to his birth family. There was, it was as if his existence disappeared there. He did not exist any longer. But second, he became an heir to the new father's estate. Even if the father had natural sons before or after the adopted son, the adopted son was the primary heir because he had chosen him for his qualities. And then he uh, took on everything of the estate. Third, the old life of the adopted son was erased. All of his previous debts were canceled. All of the things that he had done were gone. It was as if he had been born on the day that he was adopted. That's an amazing thing. And then fourth, in the eyes of Roman law, the adopted son was permanently and absolutely the son of his new father. And so when we see Paul say here at the end of verse 5 in our, our passage from Galatian that, that our redemption takes place so that we might receive adoption as sons, his Gentile audience there in Galatia would have understood this in the context of Roman adoption, which is the empire under which they lived. They would have understood this and they would have seen what an amazing event he was referring to. That, that you're, you're being removed from your old family and put into your new family and everything from the past is gone. It's as if you're a new creation. It's as if you've been born again. That kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? You see, the picture of grace that Paul is painting here is so incredibly grand. Think about it. You have rebellious, treasonous children who are fighting against the king of the universe who deserve death, who in fact are waiting for death. And yet, God, the king, has said, I'm pardoning them and adopting them as my own children. That's powerful. That's amazing. You see, as I said at the outset, even if our modern understanding of adoption were all that it meant in Scripture, that would be amazing. But it's so much richer. It's so much more of what's happening when Paul says that adoption is what we have as sons and daughters of God himself. You see, this becomes an even greater privilege in our life. It's no wonder then that J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, put it this way. He said, our first point about adoption is that it is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, higher even than justification. Justification is the primary blessing because it meets our primary spiritual need. And as justification is the primary blessing, so it is the fundamental blessing in the sense that everything else in our salvation assumes it and rests on it. Adoption included, but adoption is higher. 
because of the richer relationship with God that it involves. Justification does not of itself imply any intimate or deep relationship with God the judge. Adoption is a family idea conceived in terms of love and viewing God as the father. To be right with God the judge is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God the Father is greater. Wow. Packer would go on to say, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctly Christian as opposed to merely Jewish is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Adoption elevates us into the position of sons and daughters of God himself. Wow. That's the technical Greek term for it. Wow. <laughs> you see, Paul has pointed to the Roman process of adoption here to help the Galatian believers understand just how high the honor and privilege of our redemption is. But what does the process of adoption into the family of God look like? Well, first of all, God would say, or, or John would say, it's the new birth. In John chapter 3, we see... Uh, Jesus and Nicodemus meeting. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a member of that very strict, pious Jewish sect. And, and he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council over the Jews. And Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, John says, because he didn't want anybody seeing. Listen, Nicodemus was moved by Jesus. Nicodemus heard Jesus teach and said, there's something real about him that I have never heard before. And so he comes to Jesus, but he comes at night because he can't let anybody else see him come and talk to this guy who has already riled up all the rest of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Rome. Everybody's upset over Jesus. So he comes to him at night and he says, Jesus, we know that you are a teacher who has been sent by God, because no one can do the signs or the miracles that you do if they weren't from God. Well, listen, Jesus didn't really care about pleasantries. And if you've ever watched Jesus interact in the Gospels with other people, he kind of cuts through that real quick. And he gets right to the point. And Jesus said to Nicodemus in chapter 3, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now imagine you're Nicodemus. You just came in there and you complimented Jesus and said, wow, Jesus, so glad that you're here. And then Jesus said, yeah, listen, I'm telling you the truth. If you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus is completely, I mean, it's like a punch at a right field. He never saw it coming. And he, well, what, what, what do you mean? Born again? I, how do you have a new birth? Do you, do, do you go back into your mother's womb and get born again as an adult? No, no, no. And Jesus is like, really? You're a teacher of Israel? No. No, you see, Jesus was speaking of a new spiritual birth. This is what we call regeneration in theological terms. We need to experience a new spiritual birth because... By our sin nature that we have inherited from our forefather Adam, we're spiritually dead. And dead spiritual people cannot see the spiritual kingdom of God. Let me put it to you this way. A dead spiritual person can no more be the citizen of a spiritual kingdom than a dead physical person can be the citizen of a physical kingdom. You just can't do it. That's why the new birth is so important. And that's why John wrote in the prologue to his gospel in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, listen, 
who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, our regeneration is a spiritual event that comes as a gift from God, not from anything we do. Now, once we've been regenerated, once it is that our hearts have been made alive through the new birth, we're able to hear that gospel call to conversion, to, to turn away and repent and believe in Jesus Christ. I, I, I've read this many times about Erwin Lutzer, who is the pastor emeritus of the Moody Church in Chicago. And he has taught preaching courses at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School over in Chicago. And every semester, he would take his, his preaching students to a local graveyard. And he would take them to a grave. And he would have the student, he'd just pick a student at random and say, Joe, come here. Preach to uh, Mr. Smith. Preach to him and call him to repentance. And the student looks at a headstone. And... They just kind of stammer and what, what uh, I'm not sure what you want me to do. And then Lutzer turns and he says, Mr. Smith, Jesus is salvation. You need to be born again. And he stops and he turns to his class and he says, this is what it's like preaching to the lost who are dead in their sin. The only way they will hear what you have to say is if God works a miracle in their life to give them new birth and a regenerated heart to hear the spiritual truth of what it is that you are proclaiming. If that doesn't happen, they can't hear. They're still dead. Maybe you've, maybe you've encountered that. Have you ever been sharing the gospel with someone and they just don't hear what you have to say. They just reject it. They ignore it. And then all of a sudden, one day, you say the same thing you have said for maybe years. And all of a sudden, it's like, why haven't you ever told me that before? And you go, I have. But you couldn't hear it. You see, something happened in that person. A miracle took place, and that miracle is regeneration. That's an amazing, amazing thing. And once that happens, they've been regenerated. They've heard the gospel call. They, they answer it. And they, they are now putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Then they are adopted by him into the family. Wow. And here we see one of the great mysteries of God's salvation. You see, here on this side of heaven... We look and we see that God has commanded us to preach the gospel to everyone so that whosoever will, will respond and come to faith in Christ. But then one day we're going to get to heaven and we're going to truly and fully understand what Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 means. When Paul writes there, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Wow. That's a word you need to get used to when you start talking about adoption. Because it just is mind-blowing when you think about this. On the one hand, God says, go and preach to whosoever will. And on the other hand, he says, I already chose them before the foundation of the earth. Wow. How does that work? Maybe another sermon. You see, that is amazing grace right there. But God's grace just continues to give and it continues to demonstrate how great he is because once we have been adopted into his family, he seals us with his Holy Spirit. In Romans 8, 6, Paul writes, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Wow. 
When you think back to that magisterial first chapter of, of Ephesians, Paul would put it this way. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now next week we're going to be examining the Holy Spirit in more detail, how he is one of the greatest Christmas gifts that God has given. So I don't want to belabor the point right now, but what I do want you to see is that it is God who seals the relationship with his children by giving them the Holy Spirit who then permanently indwells them and is the guarantee of their inheritance. Now, as we've seen, adopted children come into the family of God, not as second-class children, but as full sons and daughters with a full inheritance. And, and every one of us here has been a child in a family. Every, in fact, some of you may right now be children in your family. And if you think back to that time when you were a child, you know that there were certain responsibilities that went into being part of a family. Maybe you had chores to do. Maybe you had dishes to wash or trash to take out or dusting to do. I see some of you nodding your heads. You know what it is. You have responsibilities because you are part of the family. Well, brothers and sisters, being part of the family of God entails certain responsibilities as well. We as children have responsibilities in God's family. And the first one, I want to share just a few with you. The first one is that God's children glorify and enjoy him forever. And, and here we see both a responsibility and a reward, don't we? We glorify him and re enjoy him forever. But how do we glorify him? We glorify him by living lives of holiness, in pursuit of holiness, in pursuit of righteousness. You see, Jesus has called us to deny ourselves and to take up our cross daily, right? To remember him first and foremost. And we see that in Romans 12, 1, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. You see, when we deny those fleshly, sinful desires and we pursue Christ's holiness, we're glorifying God. We're bringing glory to him and we're letting our lives be a living testimony to everyone in the world to see what he has done by his gospel. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we can get our head around this. We can understand that we need to deny ourselves. We can understand that we need to live a holy life. Where we have trouble, where the problem comes in is, how do you live a holy life and enjoy it? I mean, let's be honest, right? That's what most people struggle with. How do I live this holy life and still enjoy God? Because we, we seem to think that, that this is difficult that it is impossible. You can't deny yourself and enjoy God forever. Well, C.S. Lewis observed that we are too obsessed with the finite pleasures of this world. We're too obsessed with drink and food and relationships and, and all the things that go along with that, right? We're too obsessed with that and we dismiss the infinite joy that is available to us through Christ. You see, holiness is not the absence of pleasure and joy. Holiness is the reordering of what we find desirous and, and pleasurable based on our new desires of our regenerated heart. That's what holiness is. It's, it's finding joy and pleasure in the things of God, not in the things of this world. Now, second, and this plays out of that, God's children imitate their heavenly father. Paul tells the Ephesian church in 5.1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Now as you study scripture, you learn more and more about who God is. You learn about his characteristics. You learn about his attributes. You learn about the great things of God, right? And you, you say, is God loving? 
Is God loving even to those who are against him? Yes. And so we are to be imitators of God by loving other people, even our enemies, even those who persecute us, even those who insult us, we are to love and be a reflection, an imitation of God. Is God merciful even to those who don't deserve it? Yes. And so we are to be imitators of God by being merciful to those who cross our paths in life. Sometimes being merciful means helping somebody with a physical need. They might need cash. They might need food. They might need something and you can meet it. And so you do. Being merciful might mean that you have somebody who just needs a shoulder to cry on and an ear to bend. And you give them that time. We should be merciful to one another. Is, is God forgiving? Yes. And so we are called to be imitators of God by forgiving one another. Oh, pastor, you're meddling now, right? No. We are to graciously and generously forgive those who sin against us. Listen, brothers and sisters, when we imitate God, we're showing our family resemblance. We're showing the resemblance that we have with our father. But third, God's children live by their heavenly father's standards. First Peter 1, 14 through 16, the apostle wrote, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You see, our enemy would love nothing more than to convince you that holiness is an austere joylessness that is overly concerned that somewhere, someone is having a good time. That's what he would like you to believe holiness is. Here's another good Greek term, hogwash. That is not what holiness is. We've already seen you can enjoy God forever and glorify him through your holiness. No, no, no. You see, if you believe that, if you believe that holiness is just austerity, like you're a caricature of the Puritans wearing your black hat with the buckle on it and, black and just never smiling. That's not who the Puritans were, by the way. But if that's what you think holiness is, then what's happened is you have subverted the relationship between holiness and joy in Christ and sin and misery. You've exactly inverted those. You've come to believe that holiness brings misery and sin brings joy. That's exactly wrong. But that's what our enemy wants us to believe. We need to understand that sin is for a season enjoyable. If it weren't, you wouldn't be tempted by it. But sin always brings destruction, decay, and death. Always. No exceptions. That's why John in his first letter would draw such a stark contrast here. He says, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Brothers and sisters, we have some responsibilities. But that's not all we have. As adopted children of God... We have privileges that are beyond our imagination. Let's go over some of those real quick. Some of these privileges as adopted children of God. First of all, we have direct access to the Father. Hebrews 4.16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, under the old covenant, 
God's people could not directly approach God. They had to have a mediator. And who were the mediators? The priests. The priests had to offer sacrifices. The priests had to intercede on behalf of the nation of Israel. And they did this over and over. But then Messiah came. Jesus the spotless Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And when he was on the cross, bearing every ounce of the wrath of God for you and me, and, and in that moment when he cries out, it is finished! The veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies, that place where the high priest could only enter one time a year to sprinkle the blood in there to atone for the sins of Israel for that year, only once, right? That veil tore! And not just from bottom to top. No, no, no. Top to bottom. It was God who had now opened access to himself through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, as the adopted sons and daughters of the king, you can go to the throne of grace directly and confidently. Mm, thank you. Yes. Absolutely. And one way we experience that access is through our prayers. You know, as a believer, when we pray, they don't just hit the ceiling and bounce back down. Our prayers are heard and answered by our Father. Listen to what John says here. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. The Lord hears and answers his prayers when they are according to his will. Praise God. That doesn't mean you get everything you ask for because you don't always ask according to his will, right? And sometimes the answer is wait. And frankly, sometimes the answer is no, but th there's always an answer and you can rest assured that the answer is always for the best of his children. But if our prayers are answered, then it follows that our needs are always supplied by the father as well. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses the illustration of birds and flowers. And he says, take a look at these two things and look at how God provides for them all that they need. Aren't you of more value than a sparrow or a lily? Yes, you are. And that's a great thing. And you who have been made in the image of God receive his providence. You receive his supplying of your needs, whatever they are. And if we're going to be honest with ourselves and look back, we don't just get our needs supplied. We get our needs supplied until our cups overflow. That is how God is. He is so generous to his children. So brothers and sisters, let's not be the spoiled brats of the kingdom. Mad because we didn't get everything we asked for. But let's be humble and thankful and grateful to the providence of God in our lives. That he has given us overwhelming provision. But we not only have the provision of this life that we receive from our God, we also receive a sure inheritance from him. We are, as the end of our central passage here in Galatians says, an heir through God. That's what he says. You are an heir now. If you're a child, then you are an heir through God. And, and in a couple of weeks, we're going to take a look at the inheritance in more detail. So I don't really want to belabor that point right now. But just know this, in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. We inherit Jesus. That's amazing. Finally, as the adopted sons and daughters of God, we have a salvation that is eternally secure. Praise God that he does not abandon the children whom Christ has redeemed. Thank God, praise him, that our salvation is not dependent upon our maintenance of it. Praise God that we cannot lose that which has been earned for us, given to us, and secured despite us. Praise God that our salvation is in his hand. John 8.35, Jesus says, The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son 
remains forever. You're a son and a daughter. You remain in God's house forever if you have put your faith in Christ. Listen, if you could you lose your salvation, you would. That's not a probability or even a possibility. It is a certainty. You would lose your salvation if it were up to you to maintain it. You know, I had a friend who grew up in a Pentecostal background. And his dad was a Pentecostal pastor. And, and within the Pentecostal denomination, there's the belief that you can lose your salvation. And in fact, people do all the time. And they have to regain it over and over. Well, as my friend's dad was on his deathbed, he was nearing the end of his life. My friend who had since, through his study of scripture, decided that wasn't true. That security for eternity was the truth of scripture. He came to his dad and he said, Dad, you've always told me I could lose my salvation. He said, are you worried about that now? And his dad kind of smiled and looked at him. He said, you know, I think I've changed my mind. <laughs> you see, in that moment, praise God for that though, right? In that moment, when he may have been worried, did I, did I ask forgiveness for every single sin that I've ever done? Is there something out there? Am I going to mess up and in a moment of pain just before I die, say something that causes me to lose my salvation? He said, no, I've changed my mind. God has me and God's going to keep me. Praise God for that. You see, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, this eternal security is not one of fire insurance. It's not a get out of hell free card that allows you to go live however you want to go live after you came down and said some magical prayer. That's not the way that it works. You see, the doctrine of the preservation and the perseverance of the saints is that it is the result of the relationship that God's children have with the Father. We love him because he first loved us. And we demonstrate our love for him by keeping his commandments. And, and we become looking more and more like Jesus through the power of the spirit in us that he has sealed us with. And then the father lovingly secures us by his power and his grace. Wow. You know, Jerry Bridges once said, consider that every sin you commit is an act of rebellion against the sovereign authority of God, or as someone has said, an act of cosmic treason. So here we sit on death row, condemned as rebels, awaiting our execution. But instead of the death sentence we deserve, we are made sons and daughters of the very king we have rebelled against. Instead of death, we get eternal life. Instead of wrath, we receive favor. Instead of eternal ruin, we are made heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. All this happened without our doing a single thing to earn the king's favor or any attempt on our part to make restitution for our rebellion. His son has done it all for us. And if you're here this morning and you don't know him, Jesus, you don't know what he has done for you. Maybe right down here as we sing our closing song, come and talk to me. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for you and what you can have through him in faith. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the amazingness of adoption. And I do believe, as, as Packer said, that it is the highest privilege that the gospel offers us. It's amazing when we think about it, that it's not just that we've been redeemed. It's not just that we've been saved so that we can live forever. No, 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 no. We have been adopted by you as children and made co-heirs with Christ. Father, it is too great for me to even comprehend. And it is a gift that you offer freely because of the price that Jesus paid for us. He paid it all, all to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Father, thank you for the truth of that hymn. And we pray this morning that if there's someone here who doesn't know that truth, that you would draw them to yourself and we will rejoice with heaven 
over that lost sheep that's been found. We ask this in the powerful, mighty, and saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen.